And so we're, it's really great that we have, um, we have with Jackson uh, an actual place-based entrepreneur who's going to be talking about um, the work that he does and some of the challenges and opportunities involved in that. And then uh, my colleague, Dan Collison, who is, uh, I think of Dan as kind of everywhere. Uh, he's part of the Minneapolis Downtown Council, the New Loop Partners, and is really, I think, uh, an example of a civic leader, of somebody who is, is uh, active actively engaged in community to just make things happen. And uh, it's, so it's been a great pleasure working with both of them uh, on the Root District. And so uh, if we can go to the next slide, um, you can see that we're mainly going to be talking about the um, area on the left called the Root District, um, uh, where both Dan and Jackson and I have been active. Um, uh, Paul Bachnight, who couldn't come uh, today, uh, has been quite active along with some of my colleagues at my center at the university in Upper Harbor Terminal. So I, you know, if we have time, I can talk a bit about that. But I think we'll probably end up focusing on the root district. So maybe I'll start with you, Dan. Do you want to just give a little bit of a history of how the whole root district evolved and came to be where it is? Thanks, Tom. And thank you, everybody, for this conversation. I started with New Loop Partners uh, five years ago. It's a public-private partnership that was originally started by Hennepin County when what is now called Target Field was a public-private partnership. The county owns the land, they partnered with the Minnesota Twins, they built a new ballpark, and that part of downtown, which is technically part of the North Loop and the West Side, began changing rapidly the land mass that's near the Root District. That public-private partnership was originally commissioned uh, as the design advisory group by the county, seeking to ensure that all partners connect to community and to neighborhoods. And so that group then evolved over time after the ballpark was built to become a public-private partnership that is seeking to really actually focus on such matters as land use and business development alongside the growing neighborhoods that connect to downtown. So when I jumped in, uh, I was just telling, uh, reminding Jackson and telling Tom, it was like day two that I had someone introduce me to Jackson and saying, you need to know Jackson Schwartz because the east side of the greater North Loop area has become an entirely new and more upper income and expensive place to live, but a place where a lot of people also go for uh, housing and for food and for work. The west side is quite a contrast. And this area of intrigue, the Root District, uh, became immediately a point of study because it really is an interstitial space between the largely built out west eastern side of the North Loop and then north near North Heritage Park and Harrison and the downtown. All have incredibly diverse and divergent constituencies that ultimately if done well, could benefit from redeveloping this area in a meaningful way. But it also means you really engage in sometimes very conflictual conversations as to the meaning of land, the purpose of the land, and what it is we're trying to accomplish. But anyway, this area, within the first few months, became the sort of piece of, of, of vision that had to be worked on. Great. And uh, so, Jackson, you have been there for a while. Uh, tell us a bit about your, your business and all of the things that you've started up in the Root District. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, I started our business in 2010, actually in northeast Minneapolis, not far from here. Um, and we grew it pretty substantially for the first four years. Um, I went to art school, so I, my business training is all kind of on the job. Uh, and I'm a glassblower by trade, so I learned a very technical craft and then had to figure out how to turn it into a, a livelihood. Um, so we started a lighting company called Hennepin Made. Uh, so in 2015, um, we acquired a 30,000 square foot building, uh, about a two acre site in the district um, to move our glassblowing studio into. Um, and what I really saw was the process of gentrification happening, you know, in every major market in the United States, it's been going on for several decades as the urban core redensifies. Um, so I knew for our business to be able to exist in the urban core, we had to own the property. Otherwise, there was no way we were going to be able to continue to do what we do. There wasn't enough value that we could afford real estate uh, rent rates. So uh, that was the first critical component. Um, so we set up the glass blowing factory in there. 
Um, and, you know, kind of a big part of our vision is really like, you know, when you think about manufacturing in the urban core and in, in the history of this city and, and major cities in the United States, it's this dirty kind of, uh, you know, polluting, uh, makes neighborhoods and place really not very nice. And then, you know, and then the manufacturing moves out and it's like a cleanup. Um, you know, what we looked at is like, can we bring, you know, artisan manufacturing at the right scale that really can be a driver of um, culture, creativity, excitement, um, and that's sort of the nucleus. So from 2015 to 2018, we set up the business in there, and then by 2018, we opened up a cafe and event space um, as sort of a, a front-facing component. We call it like the living room. Um, so we have back a house where we're producing lights and blowing glass. People are blowing glass there right now. Um, and then front of house, you can get a latte, and we have a showroom, and there's events, and um, it's a really active space to bring people into the neighborhood. Yeah, great. So, you know, in a morning session, the issue of gentrification came up, and I wanted to get both of your thoughts about that. On one hand, there aren't that many people who live in the Root District. There are some, although mainly they are people who have experienced experienced homelessness, right? Um, so there's on one issue, you would think, well, there's no gentrification going on because there's so few people living there. On the other hand, there's a lot of concern in our city about uh, improvements that lead then to gentrification. So what, is, what are some of the strategies that we need to think about to make sure that we uh, have a diverse neighborhood, diverse community, even as we bring in entrepreneurs and bring in new businesses? Yeah, I appreciate that conversation immensely and just need to say to the entrepreneurial community, that word has, I mean, it's in a season of sort of rethinking what it even means. I, I had a day like three years ago where a community group talked about gentrification like literally like an acid grenade, like the word, the phrase, what it is, is just erases community. Later that day, I was at an event where a very seasoned broker was being wished goodwill because they did so many wonderful community-based projects as they gentrified the whatever. And, and, and they used it actually not like we're angling at communities to force people out. It's just a word that has been to like reinvest. So it immediately shocked me as to, I mean, and I knew it. I actually was aware of it, but to hear it in the same day from two divergent groups was like recognizing there's a bridge that needs to be developed here in terms of what it even means. And I don't pretend to have that solved. All I do know is that people in the community and those especially of communities of color that, that are seeking economic inclusion and participation and even reparation for the historic places of being left out or facing barriers that are unique to their cultural group, that it's a real and persistent issue that needs to be engaged early when you talk about redeveloping an area. So the Root District presents this really wonderful opportunity because it's ahead of it. This is like a 25-year scope, maybe longer, maybe shorter. You never know. Uh, I'm also the East Town, I'm executive director of the East Town Business Partnership that saw six, uh, in six years, saw $3 billion of reinvestment on the east side of downtown that had been like dormant for 50 years. So you just never know what might happen and when it might happen. So the conversation of gentrification is really about who's a part of the conversation, who's at the table, or as one of our architects, Jamil Ford, said, who is part of our leadership roundtable, and if they're not at the table, you bring the table to them. So to me, engaging that conversation, and this is what's exciting about the Root District, and at times complicated, sometimes it's really hard conversations, is that question of who's at the table, how do we get more communities of color, leaders of color, business of color, participating this early. Like Upper Harbor Terminal, there's a developer, there's multiple partners, the city's investing tens of thousands of dollars in community engagement, they have incredible websites. We're a group of 70 people working as volunteers or just, I'm in my role, but I'm doing this as a part of the work, and so how do we actually get entrepreneurs and businesses who are in startup phase to pay attention for what will come. And gentrification is a part of the driver of how do we address this so that it can become something different than what has normally happened when market, market forces are at work. Yeah, 
I mean, and of course, gentrification also can move out businesses. Startup businesses need low rents. Sometimes places get so popular that even the startup businesses can't afford to be there anymore. So it's not just housing, it's also the business community. You know, George Shannon couldn't be here from Black Market, but I wondered if one or both of you could talk a little bit about his efforts. Do you know enough about what he's doing to just sort of talk about also how we can create opportunities for diverse businesses in a place like the Root District? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so George created the black market, um, you know, and his mission really is to create wealth for black entrepreneurs. I mean, that, it's as simple as that. Um, and he had said to me in a conversation that, you know, he, he, he's like a farmer. You know, he loves the farmer's market. That's where he hosts the event. And he, he thinks of it as like farming, you know, these black entrepreneurs that he wants to create wealth for them. And, uh, you know, it really what when we talk to George um, and some other um, entrepreneurs of color, what they what they talk about um, and these are entrepreneurs that are, for the most part, not tech-based, I guess, is, you know, one really important distinction. Um, so entrepreneurs that are selling goods, um, they need space. They need affordable space. That is really the biggest barrier. So uh, a pop-up format works really, really well because you can utilize space and you don't have all the overhead. You can market, uh, you know, the event and get a ton of people there, sell a ton of product, and then you leave. So, you, you know, you don't have all the expenses of carrying that, that space day in and day out. Um, and I, I think that is, that is the primary barrier, I would say, for uh, building more entrepreneurial activity in this district is access to space um, as development happens. Um, one thing to mention about the Root District is uh, the city's 2040 comprehensive plan is calling for extremely high density. Um, compared to what it is now, it would be 10 to 30 story buildings. So you're looking at about four to eight billion dollars um, over about a 40 acre area. So it'll be a very, very dense area if that density does actually happen. Um, with the way redevelopment investment happens, there would need to be some sort of partnership form to be able to provide space. Um, a community, commercial community land trust is one of the tools. Um, incubator spaces are really, uh, you know, can be really critical as well. Um, but in this district, unless there's some sort of partnership, um, you know, particularly entrepreneurs of color will, will be pushed out. There won't be opportunity for them because the space will be too expensive. Yep. It's as simple as that. Yep. Uh, uh, Dan, do you want to add anything to that? Well, and that's what makes it so critical. Just so you know, like, city owns 30% of the land. The county and Met Council, I don't know, another 15% yeah. because the... And by the way, we're here and having this conversation because there's a new transit station being built called the Royalston Farmer's Market Transit Station. It's the first stop after Target Field. And right now it lands literally next to... Uh, little more than one story, but pretty much underutilized, massive space, uh, commercial, industrial, it's industrial, not commercials, uh, and, and nothing else. Like it literally lands in the middle of nowhere. And so the city has a lot of compression and desire to do this. So when projects come forward, and there's likely to be one significant one, like a game changer, right. probably from an established developer, how that gets negotiated who's involved, and even, you know, taking the Upper Harbor Terminal model, what are the community benefits? And it will be a struggle to sort all that out. But I just want to highlight one of the challenges is that the city puts forward bold goals for inclusion, equity, obviously climate sustainability, that in our opinion runs counter to demanding 20 to 30 story buildings that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build. And therefore, when it opens, when you have to fulfill that spreadsheet, every, every development is a spreadsheet with skin on it, has to meet the economic markets, people get aced out. And so building in the models, working together as a public-private partnership will be an absolute central piece of whatever will happen that will actually push gentrification out and bring inclusionary economic development to the forefront. Yeah. Well, I wanted to get to this land ownership issue because, as you were just saying, Dan, there's a lot of land there that's owned by the public sector, city, county, and um, the same is true for Upper Harbor Terminal. It's all owned by the city, and the decision was made recently that the city, instead of selling the land, would continue to own the land. And so I think there's an interesting model that's emerging where, in fact, the the land itself is continued to be more publicly available for pop-ups, for market kinds of activities, with air rights 
sold to developers, which some in the development community seem to like because they have a hard time leasing commercial space anyway. They can, they can lease the apartments in a flash. But um, So what are some strategies that might happen in the root district that might build on what the black market is trying to do, build on what you're doing, Jackson, that would utilize the public ownership piece? What, what are some things that the public sector might do in the root district to both uh, ensure that there isn't gentrification and business gentrification pushing all of the startup businesses out, and also create sort of opportunities that are hard for people to access now. Any thoughts about that? I want to draw Jackson into the farmer's market conversation as he has served alongside the board. He has a lot of internal relationships, if you can draw that out. Yeah, I think for every district it's different, you know, and I think what, what's specific about the root district is that it can be food driven, right? There's a farmer's market that already exists there. Um, I think the, the most people that come to the district for some sort of experience know it for that. And so to continue to build on that, um, obviously food, uh, you know, I, I think we have a, a pretty amazing food scene here with restaurants and we're a very, um, you know, we're a very lush region as far as agriculture and food producers. Um, and so, you know, there could be a lot of different ways to develop um, all kinds of um, business opportunities that rely on one another. And you could have a series of business relationships that are supporting one another, whether it's, you know, app-based delivery services that are, you know, supporting, you know, the market and expanding that or more, you know, commissary kitchens. And I think, you know, food, food entrepreneurship and food-based business is really what could help define this. Um, a lot of what we're trying to do now is uh, over the next couple of years is layer in more and more activation um, and sort of cultural experiences so that hopefully as development happens or redevelopment happens, um, those get embedded into the redevelopment plans rather than getting, you know, erased. Um, but the more people that come to the district, the more energy you have, the more likely you can, you know, get things to start to get moving forward. And the farmer's market used to be much bigger than it is now. So how, how is its business model working and, uh, since you were on the board? And uh, do you see it expanding? I'm on the board of the North Loop Neighborhood Association, and I, I work with the Farmer's Market Board quite a bit. Yeah. So I'm not on that board, okay. but I know a fair amount about it because yeah. trying to understand what are the challenges and barriers. Um, so the, the Farmer's Market uh, used to be um, about three times its existing footprint. It was a wholesale market. So with like with many things with globalization, the supply chain changed pretty dramatically. And so restaurants um, started to source in a very different way. Um, and so it became much more of a retail market. Um, and that's when the footprint um, changed. And so um, the, the business model uh, for the farmers actually doesn't work that well right now. Um, it, it works OK. Um, the issue is that there's been more and more markets that have been established throughout the Twin Cities. And so you know, 30 years ago, you had one farmer's market. Now there's 30 of them. Um, you have obviously a way bigger audience, but there's more to choose from, um, and you, each market needs to have its niche. Um, and so when you go to a specific market that really thrives, it, it really has its niche. Um, the market in the root district, um, you know, I think still kind of feels like a wholesale market. I think there's other components that they're working on um, to try to um, create more ways that farmers can sell product or there's other experiences that can incorporate the, what the farmers are growing, whether it's, you know, dinner pop-ups or, um, you know, CSA boxes. There's other models that can get attached to this. So I think over time, as the, as the market evolves, because it needs to evolve, I think those types of things, especially utilizing technology, present some really big opportunities for um, the way people can buy, you know, locally grown food and the way farmers can create a sustainable business model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was in a food area in Detroit recently where they, are in addition to having food market um, like ours in Minneapolis, they actually have institutional kitchens where entrepreneurs can rent time. And I was talking to this one woman who had started a whole cake business in this big uh, institutional kitchen that she just rented time in. And so you begin to think, could we have things like that in the root district where it's not just stalls for food, but there's actually food production going on? Well, the other thing we have here in the Twin Cities is some really large food businesses, right? Large corporations. And a big part of their, their model um, for growth is acquiring companies, right? And so we could have a model here where this could act as their incubation and they, they help sponsor some of those that infrastructure need, knowing that it increases their chances of having some startups that then they can acquire in the future, which, which help them in their market position as well. So, you know, when we talk about partnership, I, I definitely think it is public 
public-private, but it's also, I think, large corporation and small entrepreneur. I think that, that type of partnership is really, really critical as well because the small entrepreneur um, has an adaptability and a scrappiness um, and a, just a tenacity that you, you have to have that's really hard to like manufacture in a large corporation. But then the large corporation has resources, operational effectiveness, um, organizational just systems that you, don't, you, you just don't have knowledge of as a small, small entrepreneur. And so there's some value to offer between you know, the full spectrum of the size of the organization. So I, I do think there's a huge opportunity with uh, you know, the, the large corporations that do exist here and then you know, what, what the potential is for incubation for entrepreneurial companies. Yeah, that's great. Great point. And I might add that we're not going to wait 25 years to catalyze general interest in a place-based environment. Jackson's done an incredible job of helping to curate some murals by Juxtaposition Arts. Uh, besides doing the activations on his site, you know, encouraging, and this is where George Shannon, we're so sad he couldn't be here today, you know, he's done monthly markets with like 60 to 80 black businesses in the annex area. Um, uh, Northern Spark has done like arts activations where they projected video on the side of the Herc, and I want to talk about the Herc. Uh, in terms of like educational space, sustainability, possibilities. But basically, seeing this as a little bit of a, uh, a, a very clear, and this is an up and a down of this, very clearly defined area. Sadly, it's defined by 94 overpass, <laughs> huge highway infrastructure to the north with Highway 55, and of course, then you've got you know Target Field and the Herc, which are really tall building and structures. And then you know to the south, you're into downtown. And so there's just all of these sort of structural things that sort of create this bowl effect a little bit. And yet, it's it's almost a stage. It's a place where activations can be very creative. The city has actually been very collaborative. They've invested some CPED staff time to do studies, to look at the land. It feels like it's a very active and open conversation with them. And so there are possibilities for even monetized activations that could take place in these spaces that will be more affordable than other, but also, and especially when the transit lines open, much more accessible. Yeah. So Dan, I want to follow on. So HERC is the uh, Hennepin Energy Recovery Center. Center, Center right. Uh, so how do you engage you know, uh, an entity like HERC or or Target Field. I mean, here's you know the, our baseball stadium, right? the Twins, right, right there in the neighborhood. So you get all these people coming. So what are some of the ideas you have about leveraging those assets? Yeah, we engaged early and often, and stay engaged early and often with the Herc is owned by Hennepin County as a part of their environmental side of their work, and then uh, it's operated by Great River Energy, which is an energy conglomerate that does every Thing imaginable around energy, and in this case, they operate it. Uh, and then the ballpark is, you know, of Hennepin County and Minnesota Twins partnership. So all those leaders, <laughs> pull them to the table, get them in conversations, taking on even wild conversations, like what if we could repaint the Herc, right? What if we raised the money or we found a way to maybe create an arts competition? So we've studied like energy recovery centers around the world and there are some amazingly creative energy recovery centers that have like ski slopes, like year round ski slopes, not just for snow, like they're education based. Um, and with the twins, you know, they care. David St. Peter, who's the president, he invests time in this. Uh, they want to participate and are champions of seeing the root district become a reality because obviously as fans come and go and as the park is activated, they're not just interested in the downtown, central downtown, they're interested in all the areas around the ballpark. Here's where it gets challenging. So the Hennepin uh, resource, is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a garbage burner that then converts to heating water, right? So it's not as clean as solar and wind. So now it's in a political no person's land, meaning that the city of Minneapolis has some elected officials who are like, that doesn't count because it's not going to meet net zero. We have to burn gas to burn the garbage to convert it, right? It costs energy to burn it. But 
it keeps tons and tons and tons of garbage out of landfills, which we're actually having to get more permits because China won't take our recyclables and a lot of other things. So it's highly valuable, but it's not ultimately green. And so then what I, and why I bring this up is in order to convert these, this area, which is largely surface parking lots, sheds for farmer's market, but then these huge institutional pieces, is how do we engage topics of energy and climate resiliency and sustainability when that maybe it'll need to become something else besides a trash burner 25 to 30 years from now. But in the meantime, do we just beat it up? Do we just say it's, it's useless? And, it, and, and even the conversation about environmental justice related to neighborhoods has been a really dynamic conversation. And so all that to say is we talk frequently and often with leaders, with county electeds, with those who are invested in it. And we'd like to make this sort of an educational space to not say, oh, this is the greatest thing ever, but to say this is a lot better than putting garbage in land, so what can we do to create economies? What can we do to create educational experiences? What can we do, because we started three work groups, equity, climate, and creativity. How can we make climate an entrepreneurial space for activations? And that's where artists can come into play, specialists in sustainability, and uh, hopefully there'll be some requests for proposals along the way that can begin to get at that. I want to follow on the creativity point. So, you know, Jackson, you're an artist by, by education, right? So what role can the art community and the creative community play in a place like the Root District um, to, you know, reimagine what Herc is, to think, reimagine events and other kinds of things? Any thoughts about... Um, because I also think artists are quite entrepreneurial. You, you almost have to be uh, to succeed as an artist. So any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, artists, they, they like to take risks, um, and so they have that in common with entrepreneurs. Um, and I think they see things maybe more unconventionally. Um, I, you know, this is my first experience working on sort of a long-range planning effort. And so as, a, you know, an artist sitting in a room with a bunch of planning professionals um, and trying to catch up on all the language and um, terminology and... Uh, you know, and just asking, well, why? Constantly asking why, why can't we do it that way? Or can this, is this a possibility? Um, and fortunate to be around a lot of really wonderful professionals who do, don't shoot that down. They allow for that sort of exploration to happen. So I think on, on two layers, more on the, you know, sort of the consistency of building a foundation, whether it's murals and activations and making the place more interesting. Um, you know, that's the more sort of uh, tactical level. And then I think more on the strategy level is like thinking really big or thinking really unconventional and challenging some of the, the conventional ways that things happen. Um, you know, if you talk to, you know, I have a few colleagues that are, uh, you know, work with very um, seasoned development firm, real estate development firms, and, you know, in conversations, they'll say it's a follow the herd, you know, mentality, right? Because there's a proven model, why change it? Um, but that, that doesn't necessarily get us the best outcomes always, right? It, it cr satisfies certain criteria on a spreadsheet, but it maybe doesn't give us a great place to start a business or to live, work, to feel like we're connected to one another. So I think that's where artists can come in and, and bring sort of, you know, some um, em emotional intelligence and some cultural intelligence and say, well, here's the elements that would make this interesting. Or um, a lot of times artists can, like entrepreneurs, can look at a problem and go, that's where I want to be. I want to be in, in the problem space. I want to dive into the conflict space because that's where it's dynamic, right? That tension is what they want to live and exist in. Yeah. I would just like to add that one of the disciplines that we are facing as a collective, and we have more than 70 organizations, more than 100 leaders across multiple sectors, paying attention, showing the meetings, like a company needs to develop everything at once while you're working your deal. Uh, that's what we're trying to face sort of on scale, but thankfully we don't have to do it by tomorrow or go tank, right? But if we don't do it, it will never get done, so we have to keep pressure on. So we developed, and this is, a, this is a vision summary that I think at least creates a framework that ultimately there'll be a website. We're being crazy cautious about bringing language forward to ensure all the communities this is not wrapped up. We are just getting going on some level of broader community engagement because, by the way, the communities that we have to reach are like five neighborhoods. They're, they're like... 300 organizations or more in order to make it really effective community engagement. And none of us are getting paid for doing this directly, right? It's all sort of adjacent to our professional work. So anyway, we created, this is a vision statement that was, and we created, everything's draft. 
Uh, and Jackson had a nice, nice influence on this particular version of the mission statement. It's always evolving. I just want to read it. The Root District is a place to achieve racial and socioeconomic diversity. Our mission is to engage deeply in the urban dynamics that interact simultaneously with social and market-driven forces and create more equitable, creative, sustainable, reparative, and regenerative outcomes. We believe cultural and artistic exchange connects people to place and one another. We support farmers and artists to use the district as an experimental model to educate and inspire a community. The Root District facilitates attracting and nurturing talent, promoting economic opportunity, and fostering civic engagement. This is the place where we co-create through experimentation, invention, and the exploration of the future. So we're trying to build enough of a container that you can get inspired to join in it. Wherever you're at and whatever startup you're doing, you can find a way in it if it has anything to do with the early stages of redevelopment. Great. Good. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Jack, are there any questions coming online that we should open up to? Okay. And Tayo, if you want to join us, we're in the Q&A part here. All right, we have one um, question from the virtual audience from Molly Hayes Barrel. How does gender equity fit into the work that you're all doing? And she notes that all five invited panelists are male. I appreciate the question. Uh, we have a great gender mix in our working groups and uh, they're not only necessary, they're leading essential voices. Why don't you talk about who's in New Loop Partners leadership? Right, well, so New Loop Partners is a larger group of like 22 public and private leaders. The root district work groups, which include equity and climate and creativity, are currently being led. Ellie Zaye, who's a BKV architect, leads the creativity group. Rebecca Moko, who's an architect, leads climate and sustainability. And then John Slack, who's with Perkins and Will, leads equity. Uh, all of them are volunteering their time. And in the leadership roundtable, if the question is about gender voice, there, I mean, Wendy, Wendy Underwood, who's the vice president of social justice for Catholic Charities that owns significant property on the western side of this and is a part of a video. We have an actual, like, 15-minute sort of documentary-style video in which there's an incredible sort of more level balanced version of this. I appreciate the question. And uh, and pleased to say that the, the, the voices are as inclusive as possible. And I think I'm relentless and always disappointed that we're not able to get more diverse voices as well. But it's hard, because it's volunteer work. No one's getting fees. And so it can be challenging for people who are already compressed in their time and their effort and energy to say, hey, can you give a few more hours free to something that will take 20 years to build. Maybe your company will be engaged and maybe it won't. Thank you for the question. I got one other thing to add. The other thing that, um, that we did, and Dan led this effort, um, it was probably maybe eight to 12 months ago. Um, we did, uh, we were having a discussion and we said that we needed more diversity. Our, you know, our, our small group of leaders, three, four leaders was not diverse enough. So Dan actually did the work to expand a leadership circle um, did recruitment both on gender and race, um, and that group is way more diverse than it was uh, prior. But it, it, it does take a, a very concerted effort. We're constantly trying to reflect back and say, okay, what else can we do? Who else can we engage? Um, that this would be meaningful work. And you know, there there is always a tension there because this is all, you know, unpaid work. It's paid by organizations that allow us privilege to do it. So it's, we're always trying to find, you know, people that it does align with what they're, what they're working on um, that expands sort of the perspectives. Yeah. And I'd love for that person to reach out to me, dcollison, mplsdowntown.com. Yeah. Let's talk. So, Tayo, I'd like to get your voice in here, too. We talked a bit about the black market, but can you talk a little bit more from what you know or what George is doing? Yeah, with, with George Shannon, um, doing incredible work with the black market. And the focus is to highlight black entrepreneurs and, and create a space for them um, to be able to sell their products or services or whatnot. Um, and it's located right there in w where the farmer's market usually is um, in Minneapolis. Um, but what's interesting for me is that, you know, you, you, it's like individuals who have that consumer good products and things like that, um, really helping them get to that level. Um, 
and one thing is, is about uh, entrepreneurship is that a lot of big corporations look to those smaller companies and mid-stage um, level companies for ideas, products, and, um, and to either adopt them or to include them in a lot of their large-scale plans. Um, and it's really difficult for a lot of uh, entrepreneurs to, to, once they hit that $250,000 threshold, to get from there to that million dollars, I like to call it like a death valley is what they call it. It's really hard for entrepreneurs to get there. So it takes community to come together and put a lot of focus there, collaborating with, with not, not only the, the, the market owners, but the, the huge uh, corporation conglomerates to have them partner up and see what type of synergies there are. And what sort of ideas, I mean, at that death valley in every startup that, that you just talked about, Tayo, how can we also make capital available to people who face that? Because that also seems to be one of the biggest challenges is, is getting that, you, you might start the business, but it's that, that next chunk of capital that is so hard to reach. And are there thoughts that any of you have about innovative ways of, of making that kind of thing happen? Well, one thing I could say um, that's been very interesting, and I was talking to PJ Hill about this, is, um, you know, there's a lot of county workers that pay their, you know, um, they take their retirement out of their check or whatever, and it goes into this city fund, and usually they invest into different businesses. Well, if you look really deep into it, a lot of the stuff that those funds go into, um, it's not really, it, 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 there's lack of representation with people of colors in, you know, in those, in those startup companies and whatnot. Um, but there's a lot of people of color who work in government positions. Right. So, you know, really, you know, kind of pushing the state to see where their funds are going into um, and, and, and things like that. Um, that's one thing. And also, start, Twin City Startup Week, bringing the awareness out and getting, getting it out to, into different diverse communities, encouraging them and, and supporting our, um, um, events like the black market. You know, really supporting them, encouraging them, getting these corporations and VCs and all that kind of stuff to understand, like, you know, look, at, let's, let's focus on some of the um, products out there and services from people of color and, and other minorities. Yeah. Great. The only thing else I would say is capital is right. It's just like that space that there, that we, there's so many systems, things that need to change. There's more capital needs to be available to more diverse businesses. What I am sort of trying to ask to myself in this space and with my director of downtown partnerships hat on for the downtown council, we're looking to work with existing properties and actually just lower what it costs to do business. That's another piece of what we're trying to do here. Now, we can't negotiate for George and the black market. What's their rate for renting the farmer's market annex? Although, if there is land available, if there is space available, that can be an, a, a very actionable way to lower the cost to do business. I had the privilege of working with a coalition, 25 public private partners, on something called the Chameleon Shops, which is mostly central business district now, but it's a model that ultimately negotiates with the property owners, has different leverages, right. will highlight your properties, you'll be considered a sponsor, activation is value. So when you have small businesses, small and diverse businesses, whether they're selling goods and products like the black market, or maybe they're even uh, in the like, uh, services side of things, professional services. Well, create a model where you're partnering and lowering the cost of actually renting space. So whether it's percentage of sales, which is the chameleon model that ultimately removes that monthly nut that can take businesses down, or finding some combination to basically solve the capital thing maybe or more on the, the expenses side. That's not the kind of capital I know you're really talking about, right, when you need a million dollar loan or whatever it is. But I just wanna say there can be incremental ways to get at that conversation. Yeah. And it all adds up, right? So everything, you know, uh, the cost of goods sold, the expenses that you have, upfront costs and all that kind of stuff, it all adds up. Um, so relieving some of that pressure is definitely, you know, a, a good thing. And, you know, just making it, a, giving people access awareness, the knowledge, you know, knowledge is, 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 is power. I've heard the statement that there's not a lack of resources, it's just a lack of information and knowledge being, um, being able to access that. You know, when I got into my business, Eternal Media, I started to, you know, the more that I was getting around certain individuals who had this access, I was able to obtain it, you know. Um, and I'm like, wow, how long has this been going on? And like, oh, it's been going on for 30 years. I'm like, what? You know, so making sure that the grant programs, things like that are, 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 are being advertised throughout all communities. Yeah. The other thing I'll add to that too, having gone through Death Valley with a couple of businesses, uh, 
and survived it barely, um, is reoccurring revenues. Um, you, you need to have, the key is for developing ways for small entrepreneurs to have consistent reoccurring revenues. So like the black market is a perfect example of that. If George is doing that every single month, then I know, okay, I can do $6,000 in sales. I pencil that over the entire year. You know, if I have five or six of those types of things, then I know that's my baseline and I can take risks associated off of that. So I think that's like, you know, in, in Root District specifically, that's where I think there is a lot of opportunity. You know, in our building, we're looking to create an indoor market throughout the winter months and hopefully keep it year-round for, for food entrepreneurs. And every we do it every Sunday is the goal, to start it in about eight weeks. So if every Sunday I'm a, I produce hot sauce, let's say, and I know I can sell $1,000 worth of hot sauce, well, now that factors into my business model, and I can count on that. And you get a few of those things to stack together. Yeah, it's not the $500,000 you know, loan you need or private equity injection, but you get enough of those components to chip together. It might get you from 350000 to 800000 and now you're, like, you're close enough that you can get there and start to really scale it. Yeah. Agreed. And it's like another avenue of sponsorship dollars. There's a lot of power in sponsorship dollars. So, you know, the, what I'm wondering is, like, who are the sponsors of the black market? How can we get more sponsors of the black market? And what, does that, what do those avenues look like? Uh, because those sponsorship do dollars are very powerful and can really help a lot of companies. Um, so that's, that's another avenue of revenue that I'm thinking about. Yeah, great. Well, I think we're out of time. So, Tayo, I'll turn it back to you. How's that? Great. To well, end it. I appreciate you guys. Um, this has been an incredible topic of discussion. Thank you, guys. Um, you know, Tom Fisher is incredible. Since I've met him, I've been learning. Um, so thank you for moderating. Everybody. Yeah. Great. You guys are awesome. And I thank you for all the hard work that you do. You know, like the, the free hours, right? You're donating a lot of that stuff. <laughs> We're good at that. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.